All right, all right. If everybody can um, begin to assemble, we will start the uh, afternoon festivities. I hope everybody enjoyed our vegetarian lunch. There were a couple of people who did point out that there were cans um, on the table, so we will be even more diligent in our uh, carbon footprint for the next, um, next conference. I'm hesitating a little bit because this is a wonderful part of our session here today, um, remembering a, a dear colleague, um, and it's a little tough for some of us, but to really set the tone and to set the background, it's my pleasure to introduce BJ, the President CEO of Battery Park City Authority, this magnificent development all around it, and I can talk at length for what he's done, what they've done, but I won't, I will leave it to him in his own eloquence. BJ. Okay, thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you to the Waterfront Alliance for having me. Let's go ahead and pull up the slides. And while I'm here, welcome once again to Battery Park City. We at the Battery Park City Authority are proud to participate in this event and to provide funding for it that has enabled today's session to be freely available to all. Resiliency is an urgent matter, and we need to get the message out as widely as possible. And that need hits home right here in this neighborhood. Next slide. I realize that this is often what people think of or show when they talk about Battery Park City. It is known internationally for the development that occurred here and its effect on the urban landscape, expanding the shoreline to create a new neighborhood where dilapidated piers once were crumbling into the Hudson River. Next slide. But this is what I think of when I think of Battery Park City. It's a community with vibrant public spaces cherished by New Yorkers and visitors. And this is where my discussion about our efforts to adapt to a changing climate begins, right here at the Battery Park City ball fields. Next slide. This photo, taken in the beginning of Hurricane Sandy, shows the flood waters rushing into the ball fields, ultimately destroying them. This was a reminder of our waterfront community's vulnerabilities, and it spurred us into action along with the city and the state. But it was also a reminder of how prized public spaces are, with the community clamoring to restore the ball fields as quickly as possible after the storm. Next slide. And as of just a few months ago, our ball fields are now better protected against future storm events. This is an independent flood barrier system you see here along the perimeter of the ball fields and the adjacent community center. And hundreds of downtown little leaguers are now in the midst of their season on these more resilient fields. Next slide. This is part of significant recent progress that the Battery Park City Authority has made on climate adaptation. Our work has included restoration in the wake of Sandy, as well as important policy, financial, operational, and planning milestones that have advanced our efforts in both sustainability and resiliency. Next slide. But such accomplishments risk fostering complacency and staying stuck in the past, particularly as we get further from Hurricane Sandy. There's so much more work to do. And the science shows that worse is to come. I realize I'm preaching to the choir here, but we at the Authority are ever mindful of the data, such as that by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that shows that the window for action is narrowing, or the recent forecast by Colorado State University for the 2022 hurricane season, anticipating above average activity again for the seventh year in a row, an alarming trend. Next slide. So our resiliency plan has three projects, as you can see here, the ball fields, and projects to fortify the southern edge of Battery Park City, and another for the north and western sections. The system is an important part of the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project. Next slide. 
This requires close collaboration with local city and state partners, including Kizzy, who you'll hear from soon. We can't do it without their guidance and support. Next slide. To bring it even closer to home, you're here just off to the side in the floodplain that our South Battery Park City Resiliency Project is designed to protect with construction anticipated later this summer. Next slide. I spoke about the importance of partnerships earlier and when it comes to partnerships, there was no greater example for this particular project than Heather Morgan. Where we are today is possible in no small part due to her. Heather was a tireless advocate for resiliency, a trusted expert, a champion for our South Battery Park City Resiliency Project, and a friend to so many. Whether presenting at countless community meetings, evaluating flood protection measures, or engaging one-on-one -on -one with stakeholders, she energized us to make a difference in the fight against climate change and Heather was humble. More than once, she thanked me unnecessarily for, as she would say, trusting her with this project. And of course, she certainly had our trust, but Heather also deserved our thanks and still does to this day. Next slide. The South Battery Park City Resiliency Project has been tremendously influenced by Heather's experience and advocacy and has been designed to provide perimeter storm and flood protection along the southern boundary of this neighborhood and into lower Manhattan, uh, which includes a continuous flood barrier that will protect the Museum of Jewish Heritage here, extend through Wagner Park and Pier A Plaza along the northern border of Historic Battery Park. Next slide. And here are a few renderings of a more resilient Wagner Park, the centerpiece of this vital effort of which Heather played such an important role. Next slide. When Wagner Park is back, it will be protected while also providing protection to the adjacent neighborhood, along with expansive lawns and gardens, education, community, dining and entertainment spaces, public restrooms, beautiful views and access for all. So while you're here, I hope you'll check out our new public education initiative that seeks to make the threat of climate change and our actions even more apparent. Along our esplanade, our poles we've now painted blue to the level of potential flooding. So as you walk along, you'll see the height rise anywhere from six and a half feet to 13 and a half feet uh, from where you're standing. Next slide. And so I hope um, that you'll visit our website to find more information about these very important resiliency um, projects. And again, something which Heather was so uh, strongly a part of from the very beginning. And so I would now like to welcome uh, Chris back to the stage along with Jackie Snyder and Gwen Dawson to say a few more words. Thank you. Okay, um, as I mentioned at the outset, um, this is a wonderful celebration and I'm delighted that the Waterfront Alliance can be a part of the remembrances of Heather's enormous contribution and um, Jackie Snyder, who's here following me, has really been the inspiration in, in pulling this all together with BJ and remembering Heather's remarkable um, contribution. I'll be brief. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Heather. I was her boss, I guess, at ACOM, um, and her force, her vitality, her enthusiasm, her scientific knowledge was blended into an incredible human being who arrived every day with the same attitude and the same commitment for change. Um, and when I think about all of us collectively here today, um, we all struggle with, as an individual, what do I, what do, I do to make the world better? Um, what makes the world better? Is it really an individual or is it some larger current or is it some larger political 
initiative? Is it, is it something outside of us? And we all struggle with that. I've heard people just talking at lunch and our commitment to, to climate change and, and, and dealing with the issue. And where does individual responsibility begin and end? How do we conduct ourselves within that world? And I can think of no greater model than Heather Morgan. Um, the personal, the political, the larger community was founded in her individualism, but was found in her sense of commitment and community. And it was a joy to work with her. Um, I know that Battery Park City and their generosity in making sure that Heather's work um, will be remembered. And I'm just delighted that the Waterfront Alliance can continue her work through a series of lectures at each one of our conferences so that we remember both her as an individual, but more importantly, her contribution to our community. So thank you very much. And now, Jackie Snyder. So we're here today to honor the memory of noted climate risk adaptation expert Heather Morgan and the contributions she made to the field of sustainability and risk management. Heather believed, quote, the health of the, national, the natural system is a national security concern and she dedicated her career to redefining the relationship between our human inhabitation and the natural system, utilizing a transdisciplinary approach. She was a remarkable speaker and used her formidable oratory skills to engage, inspire, and most importantly, to educate. Her goal was always to empower people to advocate for their communities because she felt that unless they understood this dynamic, there would be no real progress. As AECOM's climate risk adaptation lead, Heather was extremely proud, and deservedly so, of the work she did for Battery Park City, overseeing integrated flood risk and public space design, stakeholder and community engagement, and FEMA certification and accreditation. Heather was herself a force of nature who brought boundless energy, genuine integrity, and limitless passion to her work. She was a truly kind, generous, and compassionate person who always looked for and found the good in people. She lived her life to the fullest, packing more in her short 44 years than most do in the average lifetime. Never one to acquiesce, Heather fought a long and valiant battle with appendix cancer, continuing to work full time and speak publicly including appropriately at the Cultural Landscape Foundation's Courageous by Design conference just six weeks before she passed away. Heather was truly fearless in both life and in death. She told me that she wasn't afraid to die. And when she called me the day after Thanksgiving to say a final, final farewell, she had a list of project related items that she tasked me with relaying to Gwen. <laughs> It's typical Heather. Um, <laughs> Heather talked about her legacy, and I assured her that she would live on through those of us who are lucky enough to have known her and through her extraordinary work. As soon as our call ended, I realized that the most fitting way to honor Heather was through a lecture series in her name. When I reached out to Chris about partnering with the Waterfront Alliance, I didn't even have to finish my sentence before he said he was in. Heather would be so honored to be a permanent part of the Waterfront Conference at which she regularly spoke and to have Kizzy here today as the inaugural speaker. I wanna close with a favorite quote of Heather's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. To leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, that is to have succeeded. I think we can all agree that Heather succeeded in spades, and I know she would be so pleased to see so many people here today doing their part to make the world a bit better. Thank you, Jackie. I'm Gwen Dawson, Vice President of Real Property for the Battery Park City Authority. And I'm very happy to be here with you this afternoon. You know, you don't meet someone like Heather Morgan every day. 
I first met her about four years ago as we were beginning the design of our South Battery Park City Resiliency Project that BJ described to you. I was struck by the experience then, and in retrospect, I still am. That's why I'm so thrilled to be part of the introduction of the Waterfront Alliance's Heather Morgan Climate Adaptation Lecture. Heather's talents and gifts were many and impressive, and several of them have uh, been touched on by BJ, Chris, and Jackie. But in my personal experience working with Heather as she played such a pivotal role in the design of Battery Park City Authority's resiliency projects, there were a couple of life rules that seemed to be layered on her uh, many um, compelling qualities that in my mind set her apart and made her the great leader that she was in climate ad adaptation and even more importantly made her a truly extraordinary person. Rule number one was be very curious. Heather's was a curiosity born of an intelligent and sensitive realization that we're all operating in largely uncharted territory when it comes to climate adaptation. During the development of the South Battery Park City project design, Heather helped Battery Park City Authority set the tone that the authority has adopted for all of its resiliency projects. She listened attentively to all points of view. She was open to a broad range of ideas and alternative options as the project progressed and recognized the importance of acting quickly while providing the opportunity for future adaptations or modifications. We had many discussions that centered around the questions of, is there a better way to do this? And have we missed anything? Rule number two was be humble. BJ touched on this, but Heather was profoundly humble, frequently expressing her gratitude for the opportunity to be involved in Battery Park City Authority's resiliency projects and fretting over whether she was actually doing enough. Importantly, though, Heather's humility was not the result of any inherent insecurity on her part or any shortcomings in her capabilities. Rather, she knew that no one person had all the right answers and no approach is the right one in every situation. As we collectively forge new paths toward climate, climate adaptation, try as we may, the results most likely will not be perfect in every instance. She knew that sometimes what we think we know can come back to bite us. The challenge before us requires a team effort, and she wanted to make sure that given the stakes, she was always at the top of her game and always pulled her weight. She definitely was, and she definitely did. It is my hope that we can take at least this one of many pages from the Heather Morgan playbook. Let's stay curious, let's stay humble. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Um, all right, now I'm channeling Heather because she'd be really pissed if we we're all sitting around moping about our loss of Heather because that's the kind of person and spirit she truly was. She would want us to be optimistic, she would want us to move on, and she would want us to take what she brought to us and take it even further. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker in the Heather Morgan Lecture Series, a woman who needs no introduction, so I won't even read her whole name. I will merely say, welcome Kizzy to the first lecture. You know, he didn't want to read my name because that would have taken like two minutes of the program time. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today's conference. I am thrilled to be here um, and grateful to the Waterfront Alliance for inviting me to speak in this inaugural annual lecture series that our host has started in Heather Morgan's name. I'm also humbled by the opportunity to offer a keynote in memory of Heather. But first, I want to start by asking, how many of you knew her personally? If you could just raise your hands. Okay. To you, I say, I am sorry for your loss. I did not know Heather, 
But I spent a bit of time this week learning about her work, her perspective, and watching some of her lectures. It's clear that she cared a lot about public space design, stakeholder and community engagement, ecosystem restoration, coastal storm risk management. But what I took away from hearing her was that for sure the climate movement and nature have lost a star. So today I'm not going to bore you with a long list of the resiliency programs and policies that we've put in place as the city of New York in the 10 years since Hurricane Sandy. In fact, looking around this room, and I know it's a little dark, but I see all of our ongoing partners in this struggle. In the Courageous by Design Symposium that you heard about earlier, Heather and others called it adapting bureaucracies on future climate. So I see you with the battle scars and the gray hair and that ulcer that city, state, federal, and nonprofit partnerships inflict and nurture on even the toughest of us. So there's no point, no point in reciting this list because you've all been there all along with us. Um, and this post-lunch conversation really requires a different approach. So instead, I wanna reflect on some of the themes that I took away from looking at Heather's work. My name is Kizzy Charles Guzman. I'm the executive director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Although I started in this role just four months ago, which have felt like dog years, I have spent over 15 years in New York City government, serving New Yorkers, developing and delivering work at the intersection of environmental policy, public health, and racial equity. Whether in the Mayor's Office of Sustainability or the Health Department where I set up the Climate and Health Program or the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, I have worked alongside many of you throughout my career and I am eager to continue to work with all of you in my new role as we prepare the city to meet the environmental needs of the coming decades. Like Heather, I am a disruptor and an educator. Not just a bureaucrat, a cog in the wheel, but rather a force pushing government as she did for 15 years to focus climate work. And for me, to focus on the needs of New York City's most underserved and historically disenfranchised communities. I immigrated to New York City as a young teen. And as a youth, I actually worked as an unpaid intern at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, which helped me understand how hard nature works for us how important environmental spaces are and how critical it is to protect them. One of my jobs was to document and catalog the metropolitan area's flora, but also to transplant and tend for those tulip beds because garden members enjoy their beauty and they are beautiful. But it was in this job that I also saw how stark the contrast was between the Botanic Garden and Prospect Park, which was just a few feet away. And at the time, Prospect Park was considered dangerous and it was unkept. I experienced Prospect Park as the place where my community spent time and formed bonds and strengthened their social capital and they found respite. It wasn't gated, it had young people, it had large families who couldn't afford the entrance fee or the public hours at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. And as I pursued my education as a young adult, I continued to observe how critical natural environments deferred in wealthy areas, suburban enclaves, poorer neighborhoods, and urban locations. These observations, along with my formative experiences working for environmental justice organizations like WE Act, who's on the Waterfront Alliance's board, and then Detroiters working for environmental justice, helped me to develop a deep commitment to ensuring that all of New York City's communities can breathe cleaner air, enjoy our natural ecosystems, feel safe, and adapt to changing environmental conditions. Most people don't know that I am actually a scientist by training, a geologist in fact, and that my training is in geomorphology and water quality. Like Heather, I think that putting homes in natural systems that are designed to flood isn't exactly the most resilient thing we can do. But those days of exploring riverine systems in the Midwest feel like a lifetime ago. And whether I've focused on air pollution or extreme heat impacts, I've been working on environmental health ever since right here in New York City. 
I still live in my same neighborhood, four blocks away from my old high school. And so to me, social justice and environmental quality of life are very personal. And I am in public service because I am working towards a city where government's infrastructure planning and funding decisions don't intentionally or inadvertently expose people to environmental pollution, to poor housing conditions, to health disparities or displacement, and inequitable access to quality open spaces. I want a city where we see thriving neighborhoods, not disparities in environmental quality from borough to borough and street to street. At the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice, or the climate team as I call it, because it's too long. Our role is to lead the city's strategic direction as it pertains to environmental sustainability and resiliency with a focus on environmental justice and to coordinate with agencies so that we can get this work done. As you know, it takes everyone. So I am thrilled to lead a team that will ensure that New York City is prepared to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change, but also the team that is thinking about mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and pollutant emissions and implementing remediation and environmental coordination efforts from an equity and public health perspective. Under this new administration, we are committed to prioritizing environmental justice, ensuring a just transition that creates quality jobs and reducing health disparities. Like the theme of this conference, we believe that this new structure truly prepares us for a better future. Now, I know that at least some of you are not thrilled with that idea. If we are the office that does everything, how can we prioritize and do justice to any one thing? But in that preparing and adapting bureaucracies for future climate, that panel, Heather said, if you learn the system, you can work within the system. She was clear. She said, it does fall on us to learn more so we can do more and do more quickly. She hoped that with those words, she could impart optimism to the audience. And I feel the same way about my new team and our more expansive charge. We simply don't have time for the mayor's office of resiliency separate from the office of sustainability or environmental remediation. No, we don't have time for the silos and turfs and people's legacies when what is at stake is so interconnected and profoundly important. We have to work together and infuse health and justice into everything we do. Now, for some of you in the audience, that might mean only ecosystem health or economic vitality or flood protection measures that maintain the safety of our neighborhoods. But for me, it means not meeting our climate or our sustainability goals on the backs of the poorest and the most at risk New Yorkers. And I take that view in honor of that 15 year old black girl who broke a lot of sweat moving the purple tulips to the right bed at the Botanical Garden while her neighbors endured asthma. My team is working towards a just transition for our city away from fossil fuels and towards a green economy and ensuring that the city remains committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. As we work to reduce the city's emissions and improve air quality and expand renewable energy sources, we're also working on adaptation so that we're prepared to respond to chronic conditions like prolonged summer heat and tidal flooding, as well as acute events like heat waves and flooding that's caused by coastal storm surge and extreme rainfall. This multi-hazard approach allows us to understand how climate risks can really result in compounding impacts to people, and it allows us to prioritize work that provides multiple benefits for New Yorkers. The scope and urgency of the challenge we face is real and significant. I don't have to tell you, Hurricane Sandy cost us the lives of 44 New Yorkers and over $19 billion in damages, with nearly 90,000 buildings inundated and over 2 million people without power, and thousands of our residents displaced. And then in summer of 2020, severe heat waves coincided with the COVID-19 pandemic, placing our most vulnerable communities, our low-income neighbors, with chronic health conditions in harm's way due to a lack of accessible air conditioning. Extreme heat is the deadliest climate hazard in New York City, causing over 350 deaths annually due to heat stroke or heat exacerbated medical conditions with particular impacts on low-income black and brown New Yorkers. 
each of those deaths are fully preventable. And just last year, as we recall, Hurricane Ida tragically caused 13 deaths, severe street flooding, extensive property damage, and the temporary collapse of the entire subway system. All that to say that, as you know, extreme weather is here, and it comes in many forms, and it's becoming both more frequent and more intense. So my team is committed to acting now and planning across every possible time horizon, bringing together our partners for an all-hands-on-deck approach to both climate mitigation and adaptation. We have been working for more than a decade to make New Yorkers safer as we face these hazards, and we have completed hundreds of projects and implemented important policy changes along the way. Green infrastructure, expanded sewers, grid redundancy, coastal protection projects, emergency communications, tree plantings, cool roofs, reforms to building and zoning codes, and flood insurance. These are all critical components of our strategy, but we must keep growing and iterating and partnering together to make our efforts durable. Again, Heather reminds us that we must do more and learn more and to do more quickly. We know that there is no size fits all solution and we do need to keep expanding our toolkit, stretching our resources, involving communities in the conversation and ensuring that equity is central to how we do our work together. So let me just say a word about equity and inclusion, which I know is a flavor du jour since the murder of George Floyd in 2020, almost exactly two years ago to the day. Many of you have likely heard me say before that I would like to see more and more people, more government agencies, more nonprofits, more funders, move past thinking of equity as community engagement and start to align work with the goals about redressing injustice, redressing health disparities, and actually achieving meaningful inclusion. So I'd like to share that as I learned about Heather, I came across a touching moment that her colleague and friend orchestrated in the Courageous by Design conference. Heather had been slated to present in that Adapting Bureaucracies for a Future Climate panel, and this was at the end of October, so she was unable to make it in person. This was just a few weeks before uh, she passed, as you know, but still, she recorded her presentation, and on the day, the moderator had her live on speakerphone, holding his phone up to the mic so that Heather could remind the audience to pick up the phone and call her and so that she could tell the audience, we have to learn more and do more and do more quickly to address the climate crisis. She was bound with energy, boundless energy. Now, in a world where every hangnail I now get is COVID, <laughs> this woman truly inspires. She showed up, but another MVP here is her colleague, Charles Bierbaum, who brought her into the space virtually and allowed her the time and comfort of her own arrangements instead of squeezing everybody into an indoor space during a pandemic. So shout out to those of you out there who understand that meaningful inclusion truly means meeting people where they are and that including their voices, even when it's a bit weird and maybe it's inconvenient, is a necessity and not a nice to have. Engagement in communities with ample train access, higher average incomes and less diversity can be easy. Engagement in communities that requires to stretch and travel and translate might be less so. Shout out to those urban planners who roll up their sleeves and step away from their computers and head to community board and resiliency planning meetings in the Rockaways, Bay Ridge, and Canarsie. Shout out to those organizations that pass through their funding to groups on the ground so they can organize and have the ability to achieve self-determination and develop climate stewards across the five boroughs. Shout out to those of you who bring these diverse voices into the space, even if it's a pain in the neck, and not just when we want to check a box about engagement. So let's do more of that. I have to say that these challenges and non-inclusive approaches are not new. So that's why I am excited 
about the new orientation of our office as set forward by this administration and the mayor's intersectional approach to climate leadership because it is centered on a commitment to include historically excluded voices and it is committed to justice. Some important efforts are already underway, which I think reflect this administration's perspective on how we are leading and plan to engage on climate change, resiliency, and sustainability. I also want to underscore that we're actively listening right now, even as we move critical work forward. There's a lot of learning available to us and a lot of conversations we still need to have with communities, with advocates, and across governmental agencies in order to develop and advance the tools and strategies we need for a livable future. And frankly, I have questions for you too. What is an acceptable level of resiliency for New York City? What does that end state look like? Not the process, the end state. And is that the same for the financial district versus the whole? What is our collective vision for a climate adapted future and climate adapted infrastructure? What would a locally preferred plan look like instead of the US Army Corps of Engineers tentatively selected plan for the New York and New Jersey Harbor? How do we get and fund projects that actually address the physical and social challenges our communities face? Heather believed that the health of the natural system is a natural, national security concern. And I agree. And I would add that the health of our neighborhoods is a national security concern. So let's discuss how we address both. I do want to talk briefly about our federal partners. About five months ago, Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. The level of investment from this law presents a once in a generation moment for the city to fund critical infrastructure projects that will benefit residents for decades to come. Federal funding is critical to achieving our ambitious climate goals because of the enormous cost to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and adapt to climate hazards. Despite these costs, the benefits are even more significant. Federally funded climate projects can generate incredible economic activity and green jobs to transform our energy system, make our food system more resilient, retrofit our buildings, and protect residents from environmental hazards. Federal funding opportunities will play a pivotal role in the development of a greener economy, which is essential as we recover from the effects of the pandemic. I often think about how important it is that physical and social infrastructure can actually help or hinder communities. I think about that intersection all the time. And why is it that we need new planning guidelines that bake environmental health into policies we're developing and investments we are making today. We're planning now for a changing climate, but what we need to plan for is healthy communities to do less harm with our existing infrastructure. And we need to plan for infrastructure that can actually withstand the climate conditions at the end of their useful life. We need to focus on increasing economic opportunity, designing for active living and healthy homes and workplaces and safe and walkable neighborhoods like this one. The photos are amazing. This before and after transformation truly speaks to the power of creative thinking and a lot of sweat equity. We want to invest in awesome schools, awesome senior and cooling centers and libraries that foster and strengthen social capital that serve as resiliency hubs that improve our health. And I think that Heather would agree that public space design plays a critical role in resiliency. The most sustainable and resilient thing we can do is keep New Yorkers in their homes and to keep their lights on. Ultimately, Every New Yorker we push out of New York City due to unaffordable rents and climate gentrification is a New Yorker whose environmental footprint will increase wherever they end up in the US. They'll likely have a larger home. They'll likely need to drive. They'll likely take less transit and live farther from their day-to-day -day amenities and have an even larger impact on their natural environment. So to me, the most sustainable and resilient thing we can do is to keep New Yorkers in their homes.
Thank you. We have to safeguard affordability while ensuring that they can partake and enjoy the benefits of our climate investments today, like this awesome neighborhood. Our office is one of many working with the city's Office of Management and Budget and city agencies to ensure that we secure federal and state funding to benefit New Yorkers and identify projects that are equitable, effective, and feasible. We want our fair share of the state's investments on sustainability and resiliency, including any funding from the Restore Mother Nature Bond Act, which will be voted on this fall by New York State voters. As you know, since Hurricane Sandy and other disasters, we have access federal funds to adapt and prepare the city for climate impacts. Key projects we are, curr are currently advancing, from Red Hook to Jamaica Bay to Staten Island to the Rockaways, we're there. Later this year, the US Army Corps of Engineers is expected to break ground on the south shore of Staten Island Resiliency Project with the construction of a large interior drainage pond that will also serve to mitigate stormwater flooding in the area. The city will also break ground on the Howard Beach Race Shoreline Project and the Brooklyn Bridge to Montgomery Coastal Resiliency Project. Our agency partners are also advancing design work on the rest of the Race Shoreline portfolio, including Coney Island Creek, Mott Basin, Travis Avenue, and Mayberry, and the Red Hook Coastal Resiliency Project. But through the process of implementing these complex and unprecedented, and in some cases, decades long resiliency efforts, we have continued to learn about how to best access and apply for funding, what challenges we need to prepare for and with respect to federal dollars, and what best practices we need to incorporate moving forward when we access new funding. That's why we were enthusiastic to share the Neighborhood Coastal Flood Protection Planning Guide at the end of last year. This document reviews how the city can do a better job of equitably addressing local neighborhood needs in coastal protection projects. Again, incorporating community voices and ensuring climate equity is essential in everything we do. And I want to use this particular forum to emphasize an upcoming milestone that truly requires public participation. As we approach the 10 year anniversary of Sandy, we are awaiting a tentatively selected plan for the US Army Corps of Engineers, New York, New Jersey, Harbor and Tributaries feasibility study this summer or early fall, which will outline an approach to coastal resiliency investments in the entire New York Harbor and lay the groundwork for a whole new set of coastal resiliency uh, infrastructure projects for the future. The release of the tentatively selected plan will be followed by a review period where the city and the public will have a chance to comment on the U.S. Army Corps recommendation. Now, it is critical that communities review this plan and provide feedback directly to the Corps. Despite the fact that this document will be a thousand pages long and challenging to digest, we as a city have some sense of what matters to communities and we can account for city agency feedback, but city residents and grassroots and grass tops organizations are the best voices for their own concerns and goals. And it's, critically, it's critical that we collectively lift up voices and approaches that have traditionally been sidelined, including nature-based solutions. It is ultimately up to the Army Corps to take all of the comments and follow up with an additional study and evaluation and conceptual design before they finalize a recommendation in a final report that will be completed by 2024. That final report will help the city advocate for the next phase of significant federal resiliency project investments. Please help us ensure that all voices are heard during that feedback process this summer. Now that I've spoken about how our work is catalyzed and impacted by our federal partners, which Heather had a lot to say about, I want to take a few minutes to discuss a bit about what is happening at the local level and how our role as the coordinating and strategic leadership body can help advance critical policies and how we hope to engage you and other partners in the work ahead. I'll be brief. New York City is planning to release our updated strategic climate plan as required by local law in April of 2023. This plan will lay out the strategies that the Adams administration will take to address the climate crisis, increase our resiliency, and advance environmental justice. We are rolling up our sleeves in the coming months, and we will put you 
our partners and advocates to work, to share your input. We hope to work closely with New Yorkers to ensure that this plan is responsive to the needs of our residents and sets a path towards a green and just future. I also want to shout out one other national activity that we're enthusiastic about, and that is Local Law 41 of 2021. It allowed us to launch a pilot with 23 city agencies to incorporate climate resiliency design guidelines and a resilience score into public projects. As many of you know, the guidelines translate future-looking climate change projections into technical guidance that engineers and architects and designers can use as they design roads, buildings, sewer systems, hospitals, public housing, and other critical infrastructure. Over 40% of the projects advanced under the pilot program are in environmental justice areas. By 2026, when the pilot is complete, new city buildings and major infrastructure projects across $90 billion in planned capital spending will be built to withstand future flooding and heat, ensuring that New Yorkers are safer, that our infrastructure is more efficient, and that our taxpayer dollars go further. The guidelines pilot is significant in its own right, yes, but it is also about setting a tone of leadership for the broader city and stage and state, demonstrating that we're not going to start by asking private property owners to adapt their homes and businesses if we can't lead by example with our assets too. Look, we have a lot of work ahead. We are the right team to do it, have an amazing team back in the office. Um, I know I've said a lot today. I just wanna say one more thing. Heather advised landscape architects and practitioners to take the time to figure out the rules of engagement in the federal system, to take the time to improve understanding of nature-based solutions instead of assuming that government workers do not want to try these approaches or don't have a passion for them. She said to take time to empower and support public servants. I would like to add that we should take the time to empower women and to support their careers and nurture their voices. I am glad to see young women here today. I have at least a couple of past interns here. We do need everyone but to make great strides towards a multi-hazard and a multi-layered approach to resiliency and sustainability, there is still much more to be done. We need many disciplines and diverse voices to tackle the climate crisis head on. I am optimistic about our ability to meet these challenges rapidly and equitably for all New Yorkers, and we look forward to partnering with you to do that. So with that, Thank you to the Waterfront Alliance and all the sponsors and organizers for this convening, and also a huge thank you to the organizations that are here today for your work, your dedication, for your leadership, as we work to create new ways of thinking to fight, fight climate change and redress, again, redress racial and environmental injustice. As we prepare for the largest federal spending on infrastructure and economic development in generations, this work and these conversations could not be more important. Thank you again.